This video is sponsored not only by the Unrigorous Engineering Clock, but also the newly launched Engineering Watches. Now let's get to it. Did you know you can find the square root of any positive real number to essentially as many decimal places as you'd like using this formula? And notice there are no actual square roots to be found. Let's say you wanted to find the square root of 17, which is this here. Here's how the formula will allow us to get there. All you have to do is take the number you want to find the square root of and plug that in for C. So 17 goes there. Then pick any positive number for xn to begin, or really that'll be x1 to start our first quote guess, but it can be anything. Here, we'll guess the square root of 17 is 20, that'll be x1. Obviously very wrong, but the formula will fix that. Then we plug that into the formula for xn, where n equals 1 currently, to get this expression here. We solve it and get 10.425. That is x2, simply the next number in this process, which is not what we're looking for, but it is closer to root 17 than 20 was. From here, we just iterate, repeat the process we just did. We'll plug in 10.425, or x2, where those xn's were, and we get x3 equals roughly 6.0278, so getting closer. Then we take that number, plug it into the same places where we had xn, and get x4 equals 4.424. And this could go on forever, so I'll only list a few more iterations. We won't ever actually reach the exact square root of 17 to infinite precision, but the approximations do approach root 17, getting infinitely close as you keep iterating. And it doesn't even take 10 iterations before you get to over 10 decimal places of accuracy. Thus, we have a way to approximate square roots without ever needing a square root function. Only using basic arithmetic, you could, for example, program a computer to calculate square roots, and having a loop run just a few times, we see that we get more than enough decimal places of accuracy. I'll soon explain why that worked, because that may have seemed like magic to some of you. But first, let me emphasize that this goes much further. For example, no matter what root you want to find, there's a formula for it. Here's what it would be for finding the cube root of a number c, and here's what the fourth root would be, and that continues. But what we're really doing here is even more powerful. We're finding the zeros of equations. Like the square root of 17 is really just the solution to when this function equals zero. Solve that and you get plus or minus root 17. The cube root of 17 comes from solving this equation. And given any smooth function, there's a formula, just like the ones we saw, that you can use to solve for the zeros. This equation here has three not nice zeros. Wouldn't be easy to solve this by hand, but you can use this formula to solve for all three in the same way we did earlier. The only difference is now the starting guess matters. If we start at x1 equals 2, then just a few iterations and we have found that rightmost zero to quite a few decimal places. We didn't have to start at 2, by the way, and there's a range of numbers that would have worked. But we couldn't start anywhere, because if you start at x equals 0, for example, then iterate using the same formula, it'll find the middle zero this time. And if we start at x1 equals negative 2, the formula finds the leftmost zero. Again, these could go on forever, getting infinitely close to the respective zeros, but I stopped after x4 because they were already pretty accurate. Okay, so what we've been seeing is called the Newton-Rapson method, or sometimes just called Newton's method. It's an algorithm for finding zeros of real-valued functions, and here's how it works. Let's say you have the function x squared minus 17. The positive solution to that is the square root of 17. That's our goal, to find that x-coordinate. The first part of the algorithm involves just taking a guess. I started at 20 before, but that's kind of far away. So let's say you guess that the square root of 17 is 6. That's x1. From there, you go up to that point on the graph, 6 comma 19 in this case, and create a tangent line. The point where that tangent line intersects the x-axis 
is the next number in the process. That's x2, which in this case is closer to the real solution than our first guess. And from there, you just repeat. Go up to that new y coordinate, the one associated with x2, draw a tangent line, and where it intersects the x axis is x3, an even better approximation. In fact, already we're so close to the actual zero, you can't see the difference this zoomed out. But here, if I bring up the Desmos graph and zoom in, there, that is x3 right there. And this is the square root of 17, what we're trying to get to. So the error is about 0.01, just after two iterations. And as we keep doing this, that error just gets smaller and smaller. Then all you need to find a general formula for all this is basic calc 1. Because wherever you are in the process at some xn, it could be x1 or x4 or whatever, to find the next better guess, you make that tangent line, which has this equation based on the general formula y minus y1 equals slope times x minus x1. Then to find the x-intercept, you just set y equal to zero and solve for this x. Move some things around and you get a general formula for that intersection point. So what this says is that the next number in your sequence, xn plus one we'll call it, is the previous number xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. If the function is x squared minus 17, for example, plug that in for f of xn and the derivative of 2xn to the bottom, simplify, and we get the equation we saw earlier. This algorithm isn't perfect, though, because let's say you have a function like this, the one we saw earlier, and your first guess x1 is this point here. Then the algorithm immediately fails because the tangent line at that point on the graph will never cross the x-axis. So we never even get an x2 since all we care about are the x-intercepts of the tangent lines and there's none here. Thus we can't just start anywhere for x1. And by the way, remember, this is the equation we used before to approximate all these zeros. Notice if you plug in 1 or negative 1 for xn, the denominator goes to 0 leaving you with an undefined function. On the graph, x equals negative one and one correspond to the points where we have that horizontal tangent. So you can see how this fails through the equation and graphically. There are a few other issues that can occur, but one more I'll mention is it's possible to get stuck in an infinite loop. If instead this is our function and the first guess is at x equals negative one, the tangent line there intersects the x-axis at x equals one. So that's x2, but the tangent line at that point has an x-intercept of x equals negative 1. And we get back to where we started, so we'll just bounce between x equals negative 1 and 1 without ever finding a 0. Overall though, this can still be quite an efficient method. Now, as I've mentioned before, approximations have become a meme within engineering and even physics, obviously. But the thing is, they are important, and they go much deeper than just rounding, like we just saw. But why would we want to accurately and efficiently calculate the square root of a number using an algorithm? Well, for one, like I said, so computers could do it. And the reason we want computers to calculate square root or just solve when f of x equals zero is, well, for many reasons. One I'll highlight that I like is video games. Video games involve a lot of math, especially matrices and vectors to make them come alive. As I've discussed in a previous video, vectors allow us to mathematically represent the orientation of characters, for example, but they're also used to simulate lighting. Things like light rays and reflections all involve vectors. And often we like to normalize those vectors or change their length to one to do the necessary calculations, and this involves dividing by the vector's original length, a square root. Thus, in order to simulate a complicated 3D scene, the game needs to run millions of calculations, and thus possibly millions of square roots, every second. So efficiency is key. In fact, here's an algorithm that has actually been used for that exact reason, for creating 3D scenes in video games. It calculates 1 over root x in this case, for the purpose of normalizing vectors. It's not exactly the same algorithm, but it does at least include Newton's method. Now, because I like these iteration formulas, here's some more magic. Something some of you may have just done on your calculator randomly. If you take a function, like cosine x, and plug in some number, it will give us an output, call that x2. 
Then take that results and plug it back in for cosine x to get a new output, x3, just like we did with Newton's method, and continue this process to get a sequence of numbers, it's possible that you'll approach a seemingly random number. In this case, we get 0.739 and so on. If we do it with e to the minus x, we get 0.5671 and so on. Notice what we're doing here is a very simple iteration formula where the next term in the sequence is just f of the previous. Plug something in, get an output, plug that back in, and continue. And by understanding what these numbers at the bottom represent, we can understand why an iteration like this amazingly approaches the golden ratio, or 1 plus root 5 over 2. What we're finding with these iterations is the value in which the input equals the output, or where f of x equals x, also known as a fixed point. The formula f of xn equals xn plus 1, what we were just doing, is known as the fixed point iteration. And if it converges, then it does so to the point where the function leaves the input unchanged. Cosine of 0.739 and so on is that same thing. But what's cool is you can use this to find zeros as well. Let me just clear everything else and bring this iteration over, because look at this compared to the general fixed point formula. There's an xn plus 1 on one side, and some function on the other side. And what this solves for is this, when the function 1 plus 1 over x in this case equals x, the fixed point. And when we simplify this, move everything to one side, we get this polynomial, which has two solutions, one of them being the golden ratio. So we found a fixed point for this function. Plug in the golden ratio for x, and you get the golden ratio out. But finding that fixed point is the same as finding the solution, the root, of this function. So notice that approximations aren't just math, they're art. Sort of. What I mean is that I've only shown like the simplest algorithms for finding solutions to equations. There are many other methods, often that look much more intimidating, but they all have pros and cons. There's no perfect method. Some fail depending on where you start, some converge faster than others, and so on. But by coming up with better approximation methods, like maybe saving one iteration to get the same accuracy, that small improvement can lead to much more efficient programs, better computer graphics, better video game experiences, and so on. Since that slightly better algorithm has to be run millions of times, making that one small improvement really add up. There are entire math courses dedicated to all this too called numerical analysis. And I was going to discuss a few more topics from a typical numerical analysis course, but these examples just took way longer than I expected. So I think I'm gonna talk about more in a future video and that one here. But again, for those who want to get the engineering clock or the engineering watches, which look like this, link to that is below, all available on STEM merch. And also, if you'd like to know what all the uh, numbers on the clock or watches mean, I'll put a link to that below as well to a flammable mass video. He was the one who designed the clock, so I'll let him explain that. Otherwise, hope you all enjoyed the video. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.